Okay, welcome into a Friday edition of the Inside the Tigers podcast. I'm Harrison Valentine. Glad you're with us. Today we're joined by Jordy Collada, co-host of Off the Bench on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Jordy, thanks for the time, man. Thank you for having me, Harrison. It's good to be here. So I'd be remiss if I didn't start by asking you about LSU's new director of athletics, uh, the big man on campus, Scott Woodward. Um, I was there like many at his introductory press conference, and it he seemed to have complete control over the room, a 100% buy-in from the higher-ups at the university. How big of a hire will this ultimately be in your eyes uh, for LSU? It's the biggest hire over the last 20 years, in my opinion. I think the last time you brought in a figure like this for LSU was really Mark Emmert, who, who was the president of the university in 1999 and had the, the, the foresight to, to go out and hire Nick Saban and bring in Skip Bertman after after Joe Dean as the athletics director who really focused on fundraising and changing policy and bringing LSU kind of to that next tier uh, of, of, of institutions. Um, Woodward was there during that time. He, he was on the campus as one of Mark Emmert's most trusted officials, and, and he understands the value of, of the people that, that make LSU great and how important those people are to the day-to-day operations. Um, I think one thing that you've seen immediately that, that Woodward brings to the job is public relations, whether it was the Will Wade um, report when the federal trial was going on of the, the alleged $300,000 for Nas Reed in the third-hand story, or if it was just being asked about Wade and the general public in his, in his response. He's a professional public relations director. He understands how to raise money. He understands relationship building, relationship networking, um, and the importance of cultivating relationships around the state for the betterment of the institution. I think it's, it's, it's the best hire in the last 20 years of LSU. And, and I will compliment LSU on the way that they handled their business on, on that transaction. Um, that was one press release uh, of Joe Oliva being removed and Scott Woodward being in. I mean, that's that's as good a business as we've seen LSU run um, over the last decade. So so compliments all around. Yeah, the first thing I said when, when he was hired is LSU PR got better today. And, I mean, you think of uh, the, the Herman situation, the, the Hurricane Matthew, there's all this stuff that kind of, you know, L- everyone just pointing fingers at LSU. But as far as the Will Wade situation goes, Scott basically had a perfectly scripted response saying, you know, he's our guy until he's not. So after all the noise over the past few months, I'd say it turned out probably as good for Coach Wade as he would have hoped. But staying on the topic of Will Wade, you've been pretty outspoken on the situation. Obviously, the, uh, the back and forth with Dickie V on off the bench practically went viral in, uh, in South Louisiana. Now that you're, we're in the offseason and this seems to be dying down a little bit, I'd love to get your impressions on how this whole thing played out and, and what the future could look like for, for LSU basketball with Wade still in charge. Well, you, you mentioned that statement that Woodward made. That's the statement that, that LSU, NCAA, federal, everybody was looking for um, when this whole thing started. I mean, all LSU's athletics department or president or whoever was responsible of the public relations had to say is exactly what Scott Woodward said in his opening press conference. I mean, it was really that easy to have been able to keep Will Wade on the job, on the sideline, and, and trying to coach his team, um, you know, for, to the next level, to, to the tournament, and, and making a tournament run. Um, look, the, the, the circumstantial evidence against Will Wade stinks. Um, it smells of something illegal. It, it looks as if something um, inappropriate was going on. But there's no smoking gun. And we can say that for a lot of institutions and a lot of schools around the country. And I'm not here to compare LSU to Kansas. I'm not here to compare LSU to Alabama. I'm not here to compare LSU to USC, whatever the comparison is. But if we're talking about illegal activity with recruiting athletes, um, I do believe it's a lump sum game. I do believe that if you go after one, you do have to go after all. Uh, I mean, you know, there, there, there's cautionary tales and examples miles and miles long of, of big time blue blood schools, whether it's Kansas, who we just mentioned with Bill Self or Roy Williams in North Carolina, to what you now believe what's happening on Durham's campus, on Duke's campus in Durham, North Carolina, with Zion Williamson being mentioned in that report. We're not all going to believe that Zion Williamson went and spent eight months at Duke because of the education. It's just nobody's going to buy that. So, I mean, if, if we're going to really dive into the problem, 
Let, let's roll our sleeves up and put everybody into a room and come up with some type of new protocol for Will Wade to be, in t- you know, singled out. And, and, you know, he being 36 years old and they looking at Wade like he's the one that invented the game. He's the one that invented this 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 type of recruiting tactics is 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 comical. And it's it's sad for Wade because it's the same same it's the same scenario that happened with a guy like Donnie Tindall. It's the same situation that happened um, with, with young coaches that get caught up, that may make a splash too early. Um, that, you know, these old guards, these old bloods, these guys that have been around doing it for a long time. You know, we had Seth Greenberg on our show during this time, Harrison. Yep. And, I mean, like, he, it was after the, the, the Tennessee game that Saturday morning where LSU had it sold out in the Meritor Center. It was a fantastic atmosphere. Tigers get the overtime win. I mean, Greenberg said he would have physically gone after Will Wade after the Nas Reed foul oh within God. the first minute of the game. Like, like, really and truly, like to me, that was that was a, like a, a, a just a juvenile statement from yeah. somebody in a professional spot showing like the true like disdain for this 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 Will Wade, like this 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 old guard showing that like they can't handle this young kid, this this young guy coming up into their game and and really kind of beating them at their own tactic. I mean, you know, like exactly. uh, it it was just um, that that was my that's my passion for it. You know, like, do, do I believe that, that Will Wade is, is squeaky clean? No, I don't, but I don't believe anybody is. Yeah. And I think that he's trying to make LSU basketball relevant in the world in which it operates. You know what I mean? That's yeah. the world in which it operates. Everybody, it's, it's no, it's, it's, it's no, um, uh, it's no coincidence that, that year in, year out, North Carolina, Kentucky, Duke, Kansas, all these blue bloods are there at the end. They are the ones that are paying the bills for everybody. So the NCAA wants to make sure and take care of those schools and not, not necessarily. I mean, did you see that the sanctions that came down on Cal Poly for giving their kids like books yep. to, to not paying attention to what's going on at LSU or Kansas or Duke? I mean, it's just the double standard is what really just kind of drives me mad. I mean, it just it, it, it drives me crazy. And, and for LSU basketball to be relevant, and, and be looked at as, as a school and an example, hey, let, let's pick them off so we can say that we did our job but not really affect the bottom line and, and not change the overall culture of the sport is uh, – that, that, that's, 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 a, that's a crime. That, that, the, to me, that, that's, that's a big of a problem as, as what was alleged to happen with Javante Smart. So, um, you know, I, I'm on for either letting them play – like they are, or get everybody in a room and change the rules. Exactly. Yeah, um, I mean, look, I know a lot of people are saying it's it's Bama now for, for 2020, Trent and Watford, but could you imagine or the, the pure comedy if Will Wade went out after all this and landed a five-star after all that? I mean, can you imagine the articles? He's going to get him, Harrison. He's going to get him? He's going to get him. I'm telling you. I just talking to, and, and I'll tell you who deserves the most credit on this is Bill Armstrong. Yeah. His top assistant, who we don't talk about a lot. Greg Hire is usually the one doing the scouting reports. Tony Bedford was the guy that stepped in as the associate head. Um, he, he's always talking about Greg Golden, his his strength guy, and how much he means. Bill Armstrong is really like the steadying force on that staff. And, and from a recruitment standpoint, he's from that area. He's from the the, the the Mobile area. He grew up with Watford's father. They played high school basketball together. And he's the one that's kept LSU relevant the whole time and been communicating with Watford and his family on what the stance is with Wade. Wade's done a great job in, in, in the short term here over the last month since being reinstated of, you know, just trying to get the message through. I think the Watford family is still a little – they're a little uneasy on what the future looks like for Wade. But – you know, like I, I you know, yep. I I believe that that once this thing all wraps up, that that he's going to be in Baton Rouge, and and I'm with you. Wouldn't be I mean, surprised. Like, yeah. Um, I, I, what a great story. Yeah. A reinstatement to get a five star. <laughs> yeah. Um. Now we're going to move on to some uh some little spring football recap. LSU will likely be favored in every game they play, except for that one game we've all grown to know and love. How big? is that Texas trip to you? Because I see it as the biggest game on our schedule. Make it out of Austin, and it's basically full speed ahead until you until you travel to Tuscaloosa. 
So, you know, I do radio every day with T-Bob Hebert, and yes. he was on that 2011 team that finished undefeated in the regular season and was one of the most dominant college football teams of all time. But I think they're one of the most. I think they're the best team of all time to not win a championship. No, oh, no doubt. There's no, no doubt about that. Maybe that Miami team that got jobbed by the uh, the call from Ohio State can be in that conversation. But, no, it's that 2011 team right there for sure. Yeah. Um, that Oregon game is this Texas game. Yeah, that's a good For LSU. Yeah. I mean, it, it is – LSU went into that game as number five in the country. They woke up Monday morning on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Exactly. Um, you know, it, this this Texas game is the exact same thing for LSU, and I love the fact that it's on Texas's campus, um, that Texas is going to get a lot of attention this offseason. Um, I'd imagine that game day will probably be posted up in Austin that Saturday morning. Um, all eyeballs of the college football country will be right there. And, and there's no better way for LSU to make a statement to the 2019 college football world than rolling up into DK Royal Stadium and beating Texas early on. Because I'm just like you, I agree. Once you get out of there, you know, I mean, you just kind of got to sustain and navigate. You just kind of got to bob and weave yep. and get yourself to Tuscaloosa in that first Saturday in November. And, you know, I'm not ready to say that they're going to compete and win, but. Um, you know, if you can't do it this year with Burrow and the the the, the veterans that you have coming back, um, I don't know when it's going to be a lo- it's going to be a long time again. Yep. Uh, one or two more before we let you go. We're on with Jordy Collada, co-host of Off the Bench uh, over at 104.5 ESPN. Jordy, what are you making of this uh, recruiting surge by Ed Orgeron lately? Uh, is this the type of recruiting on a national landscape that LSU has to do in order to close that gap with Alabama? Seventy eight percent of the 2020 class are out of state prospects. Yeah. And they're not done. You know, I think Ogeron's done a tremendous job of selling the brand and showing his reach as a recruiter for LSU. It's a down year in the state. And one thing that we can't lose sight of is that they're, they're, they're taking care of business within the state too. You know, they're getting yep. the big guy, whether it's booty down at that at Westgate or, or the big defensive lineman up in North Louisiana. Um, you know, that they've, They've got guys in the state that they have targeted and gone after. The thing that they've done tremendously here in this cycle is that they've filled some needs by stepping out and going into to places like Virginia and getting a linebacker uh, in, in, in SAMHSA and, and going to, to, to Washington, D.C. and getting Rakeem Jarrett, who's a five-star wide receiver, or Jadavion Clowney's brother, and, and Damon Clowney out in that same area and going out to California – um, it, it's really been interesting. We knew that Ogeron was the powerful recruiter when he was when he was hired. Um, he didn't have the reputation for being a national recruiter at yeah. his at his institution, and and he's just, um, you know, I think he's heard a lot of of the whispers around losing some of those defensive tackles, especially some in state guys. Um, that has motivated him to maybe change his style, to change his direction, to get those those commitments secure and step out and find different players that he can count on um, once they do give him the commitment. So I think that he's done a nice job of evolving his, his strategy as well. I mean, next year is a huge in-state season again for LSU, for, for, for Louisiana. So, I mean, um, he's going to have to show that, that, that he can adapt back to, to securing the state, just like he is showing that, that, that he's got the ability to, to step out and reach. And then finally, just adding on that question, are you concerned a little bit with the lack of linemen? Uh, you know, five-star receivers and five-star corners are, are nice, but we go back to November the 3rd and just Bama eviscerated LSU on national television, mostly because of what happened in the trenches. Is is James James Craig and the coaching staff doing enough trying to find those, those linemen that can compete with the you know Quinn Williams and, and and the Bama offensive linemen uh, in for those early November games, absolutely they have to, and I think Joe Brady's going to really alleviate a lot of that with the new the new offense or just the new offensive um, philosophy, which is getting the ball out of the quarterback's hand really quick. I mean it, it's it's get these guys the ball in space and let these playmakers make plays. Um, you've got a smart and heady quarterback who really understands offense. Brady's one of these young guys that, that eats, sleeps, and just kind of drinks the game. Um, him and Burrow are, are, are in this film room and breaking down what's, what it looks like as far as the calls, the reads, uh, what's, the, what's the triggers on, on, on hot routes and, and, and all types of, 
um, different elements into this new offense. So um, I think that they are a little unstable, unstable at the offensive line, and they're going to cover that up with being able to throw the ball to the running back out of the backfield and quick spurt shots to these, you know, Terrace Marshall, Jamar Chase, uh, D. Anderson, Derek Dillon, uh, these playmakers that guys that, that, that just get in the ball in some open grass, let them make one guy miss, and let's see what happens. Um, you know, like the Brady, Brady has fallen in love with Jamar Chase. I mean, like a lot of people around the facility tell me that they, that, that he, he kind of relates him to, to Alvin Kamara, wow. the way that, it, that the Saints use Kamara. I mean, like there were some sets in, in spring where Chase would, would, would originally line up in the backfield. They would motion him out into the slot to set up some type of one-on-one coverage, whether it be with a linebacker or a nickel where he just, he just either too big, too fast, or too strong. So, I mean, that's one thing that, that, that you'll now see from LSU's offense, kind of like you've seen from Dave Aranda's defense. I mean, they'll find the mismatch, and they're just going to attack. And, and it's going to be refreshing um, to, go into a, you know, to go into a game with a, with a solid plan that, that um, you know, hopefully works out and covers up their weaknesses. That's Jordy Colotti. You can catch him weekdays, 7 to 9 a.m. for Off the Bench at uh, 1045 ESPN Baton Rouge. Jordy, thanks for the time, brother. Anytime, Harrison. Let me know, man. Thank you. This has been the Inside the Tigers podcast. Keeping our eyes on the Tigers 24-7.